This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. On the 9th November 1997, the WWF held its annual Survivor Series pay-per-view, main evented by a title match between Shawn Michaels and WWF Champion Bret Hart. Hart, who had worked in the WWF since 1984, was now leaving for WWF's arch-rival WCW in less than a month. What was supposed to be a disqualification win for Bret Hart turned into a nightmare as he was bamboozled out of the WWF Championship. Or was he? The night would become known as the Montreal Screwjob, but there are many questions about what happened. With the Montreal Screwjob nearing its 20th anniversary, it's time to dispel the myths and half-truths surrounding the incident. Join us for Behind the Titan Tron, The Montreal Screwjob Part 2. As we saw last week, the WWF kingpin Vince McMahon signed Bret Hart to an unprecedented 20-year contract, promising the hitman, I'll never give you a reason to ever want to leave. However, that didn't mean others wouldn't give him a reason to leave. In this case, Hart's rival, Shawn Michaels. Hart and Michaels' professional rivalry was turning personal, as each wrestler felt the other was bad for the WWF. Hart was growing tired of Michael's personal problems and what Hart perceived as a sexually provocative and morally degenerate act in the ring. Michaels felt Hart was too full of himself, overrated and overpaid. Michaels hit the roof when he learned of the sweet deal Hart had signed with the WWF. In his autobiography, HBK recalls his meeting with Vince McMahon once he learned Hart was signed to a 1.5 million a year deal. In 1996, McMahon signed HBK to a 750,000 a year deal. Supposedly, this was the biggest contract ever and Michaels told McMahon, I'm just asking you don't pay anyone except The Undertaker any more than you pay me. That would be an insult. When Michaels discovered Hart's new deal, he said, You are paying Brett all that money. That is BS. I'm slaving up and down the road and you are paying him twice as much as me. You think he is twice as good as me? According to Michaels, McMahon's response was, I had to give him the big contract, Sean. He had my back up against the wall. He was going to WCW, and now I have to get the money out of him. While Sean was with McMahon, Hart continued having problems with Michaels. Hart and Michaels were set to meet at WrestleMania 13, reportedly with Michaels set to drop the WWF Championship to Hart, just as Hart did for Michaels at WrestleMania 12. With their series tied at 2, Hart would give Michaels the victory in the third match, putting him over in a best of three series. However, behind the scenes, there was talk that Michaels didn't want to put Hart over, which made some wrestlers and fans skeptical when Michaels announced his doctor had recommended he retire as he needed a knee replacement. Michaels' famous I Lost My Smile speech saw him drop the WWF Championship in the ring during an episode of Raw. Hart was skeptical, and reportedly so was The Undertaker, with both men reportedly saying they'd believe Michael's story when they saw the scar from the surgery. According to Michaels, he received fantastic news when he followed Vince McMahon's recommendation and went to Stone Cold Steve Austin's physician, Dr. Andrews, for a second opinion. To Michael's amazement, Andrews told him he could return to the ring within four to six weeks of therapy. Most fans are familiar with the infamous Sunny Days promo where Shawn Michaels implied Bret Hart, who was married, was having a relationship with WWF Sunny, aka Tammy Sitch. Bret exploded backstage, reportedly attacking Michaels backstage and ripping out chunks of his hair. The incident seems to have come to a head after months of tension between them. Both men were cutting promos on one another and they cut too close to home. Here are both wrestlers' sides of the story. Shawn Michaels claims he had grown tired of Hart cutting personal attacks on him, then apologized for it, only to do it again. Michaels admits he intentionally made the Sunny Days comment, but felt there was no denying Hart's affair with Sunny. Hart recalls not hearing the remarks when they happened, but learning of them when he went home and his family was understandably upset by them. Hart's brother-in-law Jim Neidhart asked him not to physically attack Michaels. Some sources indicate Neidhart was concerned because he'd just been picked up by the WWF and might be fired if Hart physically assaults him. Neither man spoke to each other for weeks. In Hart's autobiography, 
He claims he tried to talk things out only for Michaels to swear at him. F*** you. You have f***ing talked to me in a f***ing month. What makes you think I'm going to talk to you now? It should come as no surprise that both men's recollections of the incident are different. Consider Michael's accounts of the events. HBK remembers someone pushing him from behind. Then, I turned around and Brett asked, What's your f***ing problem? You, I yelled. He tried to punch me, but I peeled back and he missed. He pushed me again, and this time I stood up. He swung again and missed. The next thing I knew, he went for a double leg dive. I caught him around the upper body and we went straight back through a piece of panelling. We had each other in front face locks when Pat Patterson and Davy Boy came over and grabbed us. Pat was yelling, Come on you guys. I let go and Brett yanked a handful of my hair off my head. That hurt like heck, but I didn't retaliate. The fight was over. Hart claims he hid until Michaels returned, then walked up to him and said, You got something to say to me? From there things quickly escalated. He flicked a weak punch at me and missed. Balancing awkwardly on my good leg, I popped him on the chin, rocking him on his heels. He came for me, but I grabbed him by his long hair and pretended I was doing a hammer throw at the Olympics. I was dragging him around the room when a hysterical Pat and frantic Lawler ran in and jumped on top of me. Unable to pry me off, Pat shouted for other wrestlers to help, but Davy and Crush had no intention of saving Sean. It was nothing but a scratch fight really, but when we were finally separated, clumps of Sean's previous hair fell from my hands. I blasted him. Don't f me or my family, you little f***er. In the book Titan Screwed, Jim Cornette is quoted as saying, Brett was killing him. Sean couldn't whip cream with an outboard motor in a real fight, much less Brett Hart. Finally, Gerald Briscoe was able to pull Hart off Michaels. Fans can decide which account, if any, to believe. Michaels then reportedly stormed into Vince McMahon's office and told him, God damn this bullshit. It's not safe to work here anymore. You've got a goddamn lunatic in there. You've obviously worked him into a frenzy or somebody has. Fuck this shit. Vince, I'll never work for you again. Vince McMahon suspended Michaels without pay, claiming he was in breach of his contract. Michaels lawyer Skip McCormick informed the WWF's counsel Jerry McDevitt Michaels had injured his neck and knee during the altercation, resulting in his inability to work. The WWF agreed to pay Michaels and Michaels returned to work after McCormick advised him he faced breach of contract if he refused to work. In Wrestling With Shadows, Brett talked about the realization that Michaels was turning heel at SummerSlam, something he wasn't happy about. Hart knew what that meant for his role as the WWF's number one heel. Hart had reluctantly agreed to turn heel, alienating a large amount of his fans. Now he faced becoming second banana to Shawn Michaels, again. If that wasn't bad enough, Hart also felt he was dropping from the main event despite being the WWF champion. He was upset when he was notified he would work a program with newcomer, The Patriot. Although Hart had no problems with The Patriot, he felt wrestling the masked man was a step down into the mid card. On the 22nd September 1997 at Madison Square Garden, Vince McMahon approached Bret Hart and told him in no uncertain terms he could no longer honour his contract. On the documentary Wrestling With Shadows, Hart recalls how McMahon told him the WWF was in financial peril. McMahon told Hart to pursue negotiations with WCW, giving him his full blessing since Bret had always been loyal to him. Bret told McMahon he wanted to stay with the WWF and money wasn't an issue. In Wrestling With Shadows, Hart talks of how he saw Vince McMahon as a father figure, how he owed his success to McMahon, and how he felt he'd be walking out on his own father if he left the WWF. At the same time, Hart felt McMahon had painted him into a corner. He was a heel, but Shawn Michaels was a heel now as well. Hart couldn't go back to being a babyface after insulting American fans, 95% of the people he performed before. By now, what choice did he have? McMahon reportedly told Hart his economic woes meant he was scaling the WWF back to regional promotion. He told Hart he'd help him get the best deal possible with WCW. Of course, Hart was understandably concerned WCW might not give him the same deal they had done before if they knew Vince couldn't afford him. However, during a trip to Los Angeles to film an episode of Mad TV, Hart met with Eric Bischoff and told him he had a clause in his contract allowing him to leave the company thanks to the change in tone towards a racier product. Whether or not Bischoff bought the story, WCW was still eager to sign Hart, not only wanting to harm the WWF by robbing it of a top star, but to use Hart to help them with plans to expand into Canada. Hart told Bischoff to give him the time to think the deal over. Hart wanted to remain in the WWF, if possible. However, unknown to the hitman, Vince McMahon was eager to dump him. 
What was McMahon's reasoning? Why would the WWF Kingpin want to lose another one of its top stars to WCW? Were the WWF's finances that bad? The answer is clearly no. Although the WWF would not go public until 1999, Titan screwed author James Dixon and Justin Henry told McMahon had recently met with a Manhattan investment house for early talks about the possibility of taking the WWF public, a move he felt would help boost the company's coffers and allow them to compete on a more even playing field with Turner. During the meeting, McMahon had been advised to limit or, if he could, remove any long-term obligation so as to make the company appear more profitable to potential investors. Dixon and Henry also argued McMahon was unhappy with Hart's performance as champion and that Hart didn't help ratings or pay-per-view numbers. Vince felt Michaels and Hart were bound to clash again and one of them had to go. Another story is McMahon wanted to focus on other stars and felt Bret Hart was no longer necessary, particularly with a 20 year commitment and the wrestler now being 40 years old. Another factor against Hart was McMahon feared other stars like Steve Austin and The Undertaker would expect a comparable salary to Hart. What is known is that the WWF was not in the desperate financial straits McMahon painted to Bret. The WWF had raised its pay-per-view price from 1995 to 2995. According to Titan Screwed, the WWF was looking at bringing in an additional $6 million income from the hike. Although Bret Hart negotiated a fantastic deal, he told Vince McMahon he wanted to stay with the company. With the deadline looming to sign the WCW contract, Hart reached out to McMahon several times. McMahon told him to follow his head and not his heart. Hart reached out again asking McMahon to give him a reason to stay. When McMahon reportedly told Hart he'd planned to have him lose 3 out of 4 matches to Shawn Michaels before putting Steve Austin over at WrestleMania, Hart knew the choice had been made for him and he signed the WCW deal. With Hart signed with WCW, McMahon knew he had to get the WWF Championship off him before the 10th of November 1997. That was the day when Eric Bischoff could announce Hart had signed with WCW. Vince's worst nightmare was for Bret Hart to show up on Nitro with the WWF Championship. Similar to how WWF's women's champion Alundra Blaze showed up on an episode of Nitro and threw the title in the garbage. It was bad enough the fans would see yet another WWF star jumping to Nitro, particularly the WWF Champion. What would happen if Bischoff announced they'd signed the reigning WWF Champion? McMahon's quest to get the belt off Hart ran into a number of problems. First, Hart refused to lose to Shawn Michaels. Once again, Michaels had rubbed Hart the wrong way. Hart's memoir contains his recollection of how he tried to make peace with Michaels backstage, telling him, Sean, I just want you to know that despite any difference we've had this past year, I have no problem working with you. You can trust me in every way to be a professional. I want you to know that you are not in any danger and that I have no problem dropping the belt to you if that's what Vince wants. Michaels replied, I appreciate that, but I want you to know that I'm not willing to do the same for you. This blatant disrespect in front of the boys and Hart's feeling Michaels had never apologized for his sunny days remarks made Hart decide he would never drop the WWF Championship to Michaels. Furthermore, Hart refused to drop the belt in Canada, particularly at the pay-per-view in Montreal. When McMahon suggested Hart drop the belt in Detroit before the pay-per-view, Hart refused, arguing he didn't want to let his fans down by going into the pay-per-view as challenger instead of champion. Hart offered to drop the belt the next week at a house show in Madison Square Garden, but McMahon balked at the idea of having to pay $40,000 to record the title switch. With Hart refusing to do the time-honored tradition and McMahon facing the disgrace of WCW announcing it had signed the WWF Champion, Vince McMahon was running out of options until an offhand remark led to McMahon devising one of the most controversial swerves in wrestling history. Join us next time as we look at the Montreal Screwjob as well as its long-term ramifications in Behind the Titantron, The Montreal Screwjob.